Okay. Are we ready? I'm not sure I am now. So we're going to carry on with uh, Old Testament and God's grace and how it shows through. Uh, Mick started off so beautifully uh, last week. And so we were talking about those two books, about spare and about the Bible. Well, the Bible is, is so much more than just a little bit of interest for a few people. The Bible's it's a history of God's people, of God's creation. And it gives us guidance into every aspect of what we do. And it's a book, not just for a couple of scholars, but it's a book for a five-year-old child to a 95-year-old child. It's got massive adventures in. And it's got heroes, it's got villains, it's got betrayal, it's got courage, sexual desire, wars, peace, songs, lament, poetry, history, death, resurrection, hope, love, salvation, even eternal life. All in this one book. All in this one book. And so as we go back to the Old Testament now, and we're going to get, dip into this book, into one of these massive adventures. Um, so I, I don't know if, if the kids are going to catch this later, or maybe somebody will talk to them about it, but we're going to go through the flood with Noah and the ark. So a massive adventure, and most of you will know most of the story. The world's going to be destroyed, there's going to be lots of water, and God tells Noah to build an ark. Okay, but why, why flood? Why is he going to flood the earth? Why, does he, why do we need an ark? Why Noah? Right, so I'm going to set the scene, okay? I'm going to set the scene, just briefly go over some of the stuff that uh, Mick discussed last time. So we go right back to the very beginning of this wonderful book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was an evening and there was a morning. One day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the water, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under, under the expanse from the water above. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came and then morning, the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the water he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years, and they will be the lights in the expanse of the skies to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night, as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to rule the day and the night and to separate light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. And so you can see there, day one, two, and three, he created the heavens and the earth and ordered it. And then day four, five, and six, days four, five, and six, he populated, he filled those different areas with the sun, moon, and stars, and heavens. On day five, he created the birds and the sea creatures and on day six, he created all animals according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And then we read at verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. 
They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them, just like Meg said last week. God, right at the beginning, started to bless and pour out his grace to us. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. So God, by his grace, provided everything. He provided food for man and all the creatures. And then we read at the end of day six, after he'd created man, God saw all that he had made and it was very good indeed. And then he had a well-earned rest after doing all of that. But by his grace, he'd created everything and gave it to all mankind, providing everything that we need. And so we can see from that that God is a God of creation. He is a creator. He's positive by nature. He's a God of order. And you can see he's done it stage at a time. He likes order and things to be right and proper. And he's a God of care and provision. And love. I think it's worth making that point now as well. Because this is going to come through as we go through. Because he's a God of love. He has given us the power of choice. He's given man the power of choice. Now God is in a loving relationship already with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And he knows that love can only come if you have choice. You can't make a robot love you. You can tell a robot what to do and program it to do everything you want it to do, but that won't give you love. And so God knew that for us to be in a loving relationship, we had to have choice. So, now we're going through into this blockbuster. Okay, now we're in the flood. So this is the point where you would have your first commercial break and a narrator would then come in once you'd gone out to the loo, come back in with your popcorn, all right? And this is where you get a quick summary of what's gone on so far. So that was the scene set. We're now gonna have a summary of where we are up to this point. So Adam and Eve were tempted and tricked into eating from the only tree they were not supposed to eat from. And they were tempted to turn away a little bit from God. But by God's grace, even though they'd done it wrong and turned away from him, he allowed them to continue. He took them out of the Garden of Eden, but then he still gave them the land and said, multiply and prosper by his grace, even though they'd wronged him. By his grace, he allowed that. So now we're gonna jump forward a few generations to Genesis chapter six. And this is where the story of Noah comes in. And we join it in the worst possible situation, okay? Yeah, there we go, it's okay. I was waiting for suspense, Mick, I was there. <laughs> so we now join this story in the worst possible situation because Adam and Eve, they've made that mistake, but they've been allowed by God's grace to, to carry on and populate the earth. And so they've been doing that through the generations. So here we get to Genesis six, verse five. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth together with the animals and the creatures that crawl and the birds of the sky for I regret that I made them. Wow. That is incredibly powerful. God, our good God, the creator, the God of love, has given us free choice and the free choice of these generations. There's wickedness, there's corruption, there's cruelty, there's evil. 
The poor are struggling. We can guess that just from this. Every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. After he made Adam and Eve and said, this is very good indeed. But now we have all this evil. But then we read on. Noah, however, found favour with the Lord. Noah found favour with the Lord. And we think, well, why Noah? How did that happen? And it carries on. This is verse 9 carrying on. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. Every creature. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. We haven't got to the good bit yet, have we? This is heavy stuff. All that God made are man's mistakes thereafter. Everything is terrible. Can you imagine... Well, we can't, but just think of it, how God felt at that time when everything he created was gone. And we think about this world sometimes, don't we, about all the stuff that's going on. We talked about the latest big book that's come out. And the frenzy is all about, oh, what's wrong? What's bad? What's violent? What didn't go right? Who, who upset somebody? Or who did? That's what the world is clamoring for, and we can, we can hear it here. And God just said... I need to reset this. I need to reset this. So he says, understand that I am bringing a flood, flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife and your son's wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. And Noah did this. He did everything that God commanded him. It's quite amazing this, that amongst all of this evil, God saw Noah and Noah found favour. And why? Was he a superstar? Was he just perfect? No. He walked with God. That means he followed and trusted God. Doesn't mean he was the best man on earth in, in many respects. But what he did do was he trusted God. And God, even though he wanted to reset everything, realized that there was somebody who followed him there. And Noah did that. He, command, he did everything that God commanded him. So at this point, we have... Well, Noah has been given the instructions for the ark. He was told, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. And this is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Okay? So let's go back to Noah's time. He's been instructed by God, who he follows, to build this thing which is four to five times bigger than any other boat of the time. That's according to the current scholars who've done all the, the archeology span and so on. So he's building something four or five times bigger than anything else that's ever existed at that time. Because God said, I'm going to bring a flood, and he trusted him. Can you imagine? what the people walking around were saying to him at that time. I remember a couple of years back, somebody asked me if they could leave their caravan on my drive for a couple of weeks whilst they went away. And I said, yeah, of course you can. And within a day, I had all my neighbours coming around saying to me, you're spoiled out of you, we can't see anything. Why have you got a caravan on your drive? And I'm thinking, my goodness, all I did was put a friend's caravan here for a couple of weeks 
on my drive, and you're saying, spoiling your view, can you imagine what they were saying to Noah? At this time, when he's building something that's bigger than a football pitch in length, for no apparent reason, because they wouldn't have seen the flood at that time, the flood hadn't come at that point. And he's building this massive structure. And yet, what do we get reactions now? Just as I've said, I put a caravan on the drive and I've got all people going around saying, I'm spoiling their view. Wow. And yet he trusted God. God tells us to do lots of non-worldly things, things that the rest of the world think are ridiculous at this moment in time. And yet if we trust him, then we can go with that, can't we? He tells us, you should only marry one person. You shouldn't be divorced. You shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. You shouldn't let yourself go with drugs and temptation and all of that stuff and go wild. And we've got, yeah, where are we? Just pick a commandment. How many of those are just ignored by the world outside and yet we trust him because just like Noah trusted him, we know that good will come out of it. And this is God's grace preparing all these things. The other thing that we find here is God didn't give him a time frame to build this. He waited. He was gracious. He, wa he didn't tell us how long it took to build this massive structure. But he waited for him by God's grace. And then we come to the main story itself. So God gives Noah seven days warning to enter the ark. Bearing in mind that he's also told him, two of every animal will come to you. So he's just stood there thinking, okay, I'll build this thing. But two of every animal is going to come to him. He doesn't have to go and chase them all around. They're going to come to him. So he gets seven days warning to enter the ark. And then seven days before the rain started, God also warns him. And then comes 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And then once it had rained for that amount of time, then we had 150 days, the water surged. And this is all in this text. The text covers four chapters, so I'm, I'm picking out the bits here. But you please feel free to read this. And so we get 150 days of where the water surged. And then right in the middle of these four chapters, the very central line of the whole thing, which makes it the most important, of all this, where God is now decreating all of this, he's wiping it all out, God remembered Noah. There was a righteous person, there was a person that trusted God and walked with God, and God remembered him. And then we see that for 150 days, the water receded. And then there were 40 days after which Noah sent out a raven and a dove. And after a further seven days, the dove returns with an olive leaf. And then after seven days after that, the dove does not return. And then he knows that he can get out. So you can see from that, it's interesting to see that pattern, isn't it? This is not by accident. When we see that flood and we think of all the mayhem that's going on, when you go home, read your Bible and see all of this. It's all in there. And there's more as well, which we can add detail on. This is a God who loves order, loves things to be right. And even through all of this, we have this beautiful chiasm or palistrophe, as it's known. We'll leave the, all the technical stuff to the scholars. But just, just looking at that and you think this is in the Bible. So if you want to study, there, there's lots, there's always so much more there. But God is a God of order, of provision, of grace, and of love. And so we see through this, if we go back to the creation, he realized that things were not going well from day three and day six, that bottom line. And so he decreated that. He rejoined the waters, if you like, took away the land. And we're told that all living creatures, apart from those on the ark, 
were gone. A new life. This is a new life. God washed away all the old mess, all the violence, all the things that were horrendous, and gave a new life, a chance to begin again for his order, balance, control. So it's not random or without meaning. God remembered Noah, not because he'd forgotten him in, the, in this, this violence, but he'd reached the point where that bottom line, day three and day six, had been sorted. And now he wanted to provide again for Noah, just like he provided for Adam and Eve everything they needed. He wanted to provide for Noah so that everything would be good. But this, we can also take that for us as well. If we walk with the Lord, when we've got all the stuff that's going on around us, are we going to be forgotten by God? No, we are not. He will find a way. So when Noah came out, God said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings, even though the indication or the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. And so God has gone through this reset, but realizes that actually he doesn't want to do that again. And you can read through Genesis 9, how God gives to Noah the instructions that he first gave to Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So those instructions he gave to Adam right at the start, he's now giving to Noah. And we also read through 19, and this is a beautiful bit, that God makes a covenant with man and the creatures. He makes a covenant, makes a promise. And he's saying, never again will I use water to flood the whole earth and wipe every, all the creatures out. <laughs> He won't do that anymore. And he's also he's going to show there's going to be a sign that is a sign of his promise, his covenant with us, with all living creatures. That sign is a rainbow. Okay? And it's not just a sign for us that we can see actually that God is there and that he remembers us, but it's also that God himself knows what he's done and he remembers that we, there are people just like Noah who trust in him and follow him. So since Noah, so Noah came out of the ark and was given that instruction, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And he was also given this covenant that never again will you need to build another ark. Never again will I bring the flood to wipe everybody and everything out. But since the time of Noah, just as God said a few times through the, the scripture we've read, the man from youth onwards is, has the inclination to do things wrong, to be evil. If man is left to his own devices, mess comes about. If we are left to our own devices without looking to him for guidance, mess will happen. And so since the time of Noah, it's come again, hasn't it? It's come and come and come. There is wrong in the world, just like before the flood. Man has evil thoughts, evil deeds. There's drug trafficking, there's people trafficking, there's abuse of children, there's abuse of adults, there's violence, there's greed, there's murder, there's sexual immorality, there's neglect of those in need, who need it most. What's different between now and before the flood? And yet, we still see rainbows. We see the rainbows. So if we think that everything's changed now, all different, and the world will tell us everything's different now, we're beyond that. Are we? Are we really? But we have rainbows. We can see God's sign of his covenant with us, his grace. He knows that man is inherently going to look that way and, and do things wrong and make a mess. But what he's saying is, he remembers us like he remembered Noah. And God vowed never to do what he did before. And so he made another way. 
he made another way of writing all of this mess. Rather than one man living through the ark, whilst the world was cleansed of sin with the flood, the way he made is one man died to take away all that mess and all our mess so that we might live. Jesus came. He went to the cross and took the punishment for all that mess that we see around us that's caused by man. He went and took the punishment for all that mess. So instead of the flood, the punishment's put on him. And he then rose again. Not only, not only did he take all that, he rose again so that we might have eternal life with him. So these images of Adam and Eve and Noah and the flood and of Jesus, they also illustrate why our baptisms are so important. That's symbolic of, of the very same thing, isn't it? And we say that when we trust in God, when we follow him in Noah's language or the language of that time, if we become righteous, not that we do good things, but actually we follow God, then all our sins can be washed away through baptism, not through a flood that's going to wipe everybody out. And also not through the cross, but because of the cross. So if we trust in the Lord, as we are baptised, all the sins of each one of us are washed away. And as we come out of the water, we rise again with, with Jesus in new eternal life. He's providing the way for new life. In the flood story, one man who trusted God was saved as the rest of the world died in sin. So now we trust in God. He came to the world as a man to die for all that sin, all that mess, so that we can be saved. And so I look around in the room and I, and I see everybody here who's, who's a follower of the Lord. But if, if you're watching at some point later when we, we put this on YouTube and you realise actually that the mess of this world doesn't work and you want to follow the Lord, then by all means, make contact with us here at Weymouth Family Church or make contact with your local church and share this with them and somebody will lead you through. Did it really happen, the flood? Some skeptics say, oh no, it didn't happen. Well, actually, archeologists have discovered that in that area, there was catastrophic flood many, many thousands of years ago. There was catastrophic flood there. Other people say, oh, but not in the whole world. But in the whole world as they knew it, there would have been catastrophic flood. They had no way of getting to anywhere else. So they, as far as they were concerned, there was catastrophic flood. But we also believe everything else that's in the Bible, and the Bible talks us through all of these different things that are happening, and as we've just discussed, all that mess that happened before, it's all around us, and we can see it. And our only way is the only way. Jesus is the way. We keep messing up, but what this story says to me is, Yes, we keep messing up. Man keeps messing up. We all mess up. We all get stuff wrong. But God remembers. And by his grace, by his grace, we can bring all of that mess to him. He will wash it away. And as long as we trust him, we can rise again into new life, new creation. God's grace. God is the same yesterday, today, and always. And whether we're reading the first few verses of Genesis in this book, or we're going all the way through to Revelation, His grace and His love just powers all the way through this wonderful book. So we come to you now, Lord. Let's pray. We come to you now, Lord, and we say thank you for for going to the cross for us. Thank you, Lord, that 
You created such wonderful things. You created us. And thank you that in spite of our tendency to get things wrong, that we can still come to you. That you found a way, you made a way. You are the way for us to lose all of that sin, the sin of the world. You took it on your shoulders when you went to the cross. And you did that so that as you rose again, we can rise in you into new creation, into eternity of relationship, of love with you, our Father. Lord, we thank you. And we ask that you watch over us and as we mess up, that you will guide us always to come back to you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.